involved in the community and want to give your input. So I, I think you all deserve a big applause for yourself for coming out here. And also to our future leaders here that are going to be uh, molding the future of our community. Thank you, kids. We're going to, since our last meeting, we shifted spots, so everybody's trying to get into the right spot right now, so. Yeah, well over a year. So, so at this point, I'm going to call the City Council meeting of April 4th, 2022 to order. 21 to order. Uh, at this time, uh, I'd like everybody to stand for the flag salute. and repeat after me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, again, welcome to the regular City Council meeting of April 4th, 2022. I'm calling this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Uh, um, Madam Clerk, can we take roll call? Council Member Gama. I'm really excited to be here in the presence of all these wonderful residents. I'm here. Council Member Hernandez. Here. Council Member Perez. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Present. Mayor Rollins. Here. All present. Tonight, it is my um, pleasure to do the inspiration. My inspiration tonight is for the bravery and the perseverance of the Ukrainian people that they have shown to defend their nation and its democracy. In our daily lives, we face many challenges, but it's really hard to relate to the families having to flee their homes, see their loved ones, grandparents, children, intentionally killed, basic supplies such as water, medicine, are, have been denied. Hospitals and residents have blown up. I, I congratulate local Wainimi residents, county residents, and our student population who have visibly and economically drawn attention to the unnecessary cruelty and death. In our city, we have unanimously shined the blue light in our support to the U Ukraine. I'm, I am sure that we are all in support that this all ends soon. I encourage local citizens, if they are able to, to reach out and provide uh, uh, support to the Red Cross, the UNICEF, and other local agencies that are providing both life-saving necessities and to the mental support to the families who just want to live a peaceful life like we all do. Okay, at this point, uh, do I have a recommend? Oh, let's see, I'm gonna, I'm gonna read my little crib seat down here. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the agenda. But we have general, general comments public. first, so general it appears. Oh, I'm sorry. We will now hear from general public comments not pertaining right to the items on the agenda including those written comments received by our city clerk. Members of the public who want to address the city council, who haven't filled out a form yet, should fill out a speaker card located in the back table to the city council chambers and, prov and, and pro provide a speaker card to the city clerk over here. Madam Clerk, are there any written comments at this time? I did receive one written comment. Hello, City Council and City staff. My public comment concerns two subjects. The first is a recent Arbor Day celebration at Miranda Park. I and likely most of the public were under the impression that the trees planted would be drought tolerant and native California sycamore trees. This was also stated by the city itself on its Facebook page. But recently I went to see, my, see them myself and found that they were actually non-native hybrid London plain trees, a variety that is not very drought tolerant. They quite literally had name tags on them saying this. 
This mistake is very saddening. I hope more native trees are actually planted in the future, since with hazardous species like coral trees and eucalyptus, we know how problematic non-natives non -natives can be. We should stop planting water guzzling and ugly plants from other parts of the world, since I have also seen Norfolk pines and more eucalyptus trees being planted. Please stop. There must be a change to our city's official landscape plant palette and focus more on California native plants. The second issue is that I have seen our community garden behind the museum near the beach is in a shady area. As everyone here knows, vegetables require full sun or at the very least part sun to grow properly. Some vegetables actually won't fruit at all without sunlight. I, along with others, have hoped and are trying to have it moved somewhere else appropriate for a community garden. We, the people, can't physically move it ourselves, but it is up to the city itself to allow this. This garden is very important to our community, and so I hope it can be moved as previously requested. There has been much talk about this or that, this or that, but no actual action. Please, city council members and city staff, allow and let this easy process happen. Thank you. So we have a number of uh, in-person public comments tonight. Uh, let me preface it by we're not able to make a comment on your comments tonight, but we all will be listening very closely, and our future agenda moves may reflect some of your thoughts. So at this point in time, I would like to call on Anna Bolo. Yeah, she's, yeah, yeah. Good evening, Mayor Rollins and City Council members. For those that don't know me, my name is Anna Bolo, and I am the president of Poor Wainimi Little League. Oh, point of order. The time. Oh, that's what I was asking. It's on. Do, it's do I have a time clock? <laughs> Help me out. I don't, I've never used the time it. clock. Oh. Okay. So you now have three minutes, Anna. Okay. Good evening, Mayor Rollins and City Council members. For those that don't know me, my name is Anna Bolo, and I am the president of Poor Wainimi Little League. We come to you tonight because we are a vital part of youth recreation in the city and should be seen and treated as such. Last year, we lost the ability to open our snack bar because there was missing documentation and the building was not registered with the county. In September, we had what I now call our annual preliminary walkthrough with Anna Hanley and Mr. Correct. Nothing was done until March when Gabby Basua in facilities was asked for the plans. She promptly engaged an architect and both have high expectations that we could make the corrections. During my meeting with our city manager, he advised we had to build a new one. Why did it take so long for the correct department to be notified? Where is the communication between the departments? All of this could have been resolved last year. Our league is currently losing money while the city is gaining revenue. During our meeting with the city manager, he mentioned that the league hadn't done anything to improve the park. I beg to differ. Since 2017, we painted all four of the city buildings, fenced and resotted the t-ball field, purchased new scoreboards, increased participation by 50%. And in 2020, we planned to resalt the infield of our biggest field, and then COVID hit. We had no volunteers. We asked for help from Public Works to cut the grass because we couldn't keep up. Anna advised that I needed to go through her and they would only do it one time. When I asked for a meeting with the city staff, I was told that I'd have to convey, convey my needs directly to each department. I am a mother of four with a full-time job and don't have time to waste. City Council, we hope we can get your assistance in making changes. It is interesting that the city knew we were coming out today, but public works, park and recs, and facilities are not here today. Why is that? In 2016, our lease was modified to make us fully responsible for everything inside the baseball fields. I assume this was done when the city was out of money. And now you have a surplus of money coming in from the dispensaries. Our police officers just got a 10% raise, and here we are, fighting for basic needs like getting doors in public restrooms, have public works cut the grass inside our fields, 
and repair the termite damage to our buildings. And do everything in your power to get our snack bar operational. We knew coming into this meeting that someone would be com commenting on what the city has done for us because you'd see the post and be upset. The goal for remediation, all of the city parks were infested. The city hired a full-time person and not until our area was overcome by, the, by them did we finally get some help. Funds from the American Rescue Plan Act, which I believe the city allocated 25,000 from 5.4 million they received. We thank you for your help. But this is not a service you are doing for our league. This is for the children in our community. And none of this takes away from the fact that they deserve the best. And I believe all the people in attendance feel the same way. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Next, we will hear from Myra Reyna. Good evening. My name is Myra Reyna, and I'm the secretary for Port Wainimi Little League. I've been a volunteer for about 19 years. And um, I was reading about, reading the website, the city website, and it states that, you know, for example, our city manager, it says that he works for the city council, city staff, and the community to make sure that these strategic priorities are achieved in order for Port Wainini to continue to enjoy the qualities that have always made it as a great place to live and to work, as well as to take the community to the next level with a constant focus on improving the quality of life in the friendly city by the city. One of the strategic priorities is to enhance community involvement and to cultivate a high-performing city organization. I was re reviewing the manager contract and it states that the first year, city manager re received a base salary of 187200 for the first year. As a board member and volunteer, we take a sincere interest in helping our community. We view our board as a machine for making people's lives better, not as a source of any type of income. We live, sleep, and breathe for the purpose to help. Our work at Port Wainimi Little League is a full-time job without pay. We work all year round. January, we get our fields prepped. February, we start practices. March through June, regular season. July through August, we have our tournaments and all-star practices. September through November, we have fall ball. And December, we start opening our registrations. Not to mention the work outside the park, making calls, updating our spreadsheets, calling parents, recruiting for coaches, calling for sizings on jerseys and collecting payments. As volunteers, we have sacrificed our family time. We've had to leave work early, take time off in our efforts to make a park a better place for the kids. The experience is truly rewarding and well worth it. In 2017, we had only 157 players. We now have 317, not including the players on our waiting list and our 16U division yet to be enrolled. We have more teams in our 14U division than any other league in the county. You can get paid to serve our community while we volunteer for it. All we ask is that you help our Little League with the snack bar being shut down. There's no revenue coming in for us. I hope that you notice our deep passion and motivation to help continue to better our league and our community. Help these kids' spirits, keep these kids' spirits alive. To many, including myself, my family, our board, parents, and children, Port Wainimi Little League is our home. Thank you. We will m now move to Randy Diaz. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. My name is Randy Diaz. I'm a second year manager of my grandson's youth baseball team at Bubbling Springs Little League Baseball here in Port Wainimi. I'm a resident and registered voter here in the city of Port Wainimi. I would like to take this time to address an issue affecting our city. We have for decades had boys and girls come through the Bubbling Springs Little League baseball program. This is a very community based for our children, grandchildren, friends, and families. The fields are run and managed for the betterment of the community by instructing the youth in the, the sport of baseball. It has brought many good memories for players, families, 
friends watching and cheering for their prospective teams. With that said, there is a large element of this program missing, the renowned snack bar. This is truly a major part of funding for the continued progress of any Little League program. The revenue is vital to the league's operations. Our field has not been able, has, our field has not had the permission to open for some permitting issues. I find this to be a priority for you as our elected city council. To make it the leading priority to help the league open its doors for sales. I mean, who doesn't want a fried burrito right now? <laughs> I've reached out to the County Board Supervisor, Carmen Ramirez, and also City Council Member, Mitzi Perez, for their help in getting this moving. I thank them for listening to my concerns, but I truly believe this needs a combined effort from all of you here. Our elected City Council, our youth need to be given these types of positive outlets for their betterment. It is paramount to the upbringing of this type of program that thrives. Without a snack bar of revenues, how can you expect them to continue? I want to ask all of you here present on this city council to verbally commit to address and expedite the process of the snack bar issues finalized. This is our youth and enhancing of our community. Like in your opening statements, you said, this is our future. We don't want these kids getting in trouble and they really need this program. You know, we all give our time up for this. And we would appreciate all the help we can get from all of you. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Joshua Bolo. Good evening, City Council. My name is Joshua Bolo. I am a board member and umpire at Poor Enemy Little League. I have been a volunteer for about the last nine years. I am, I am a lifelong Poe Enemy resident. I started at Parkview from kindergarten all the way to Wyoming High School, I graduated. I played sports and that kept me out of trouble. Gang life call is big around here and that kept me out of trouble. I lost my brothers and friends to, to gangs and prison. I wanna see these kids do good, go to school and baseball does that for them, sports does it. I played Poe Enemy Little League since I was six years old all the way to I was 16, Wyoming Rhinos. It does wonders for the kids. It keeps us out of trouble. And um, we just, we're having a lot of trouble with these fields. We need, we need help. I see a lot of the help going to Miranda Park. I was, I was recently employed by you guys. I worked for, Parks, for uh, Public Works. I took care of it, I cut the grass. I took care of Miranda Park. When the pickleball courts need to be blown, I wouldn't blown them. You know, the, I see that parking lot full of a lot of out of town residents. They're, I mean, they're, I love Miranda Park. But we're, poor, uh, Bumbling Springs is being neglected. We have gopher problems just like Miranda Park. We can, we can do so much better. If we have turf infields, that will get rid of the uh, gopher problems in the infield. Give us lights, let us play at night. That will bring us even more kids. We have 300 players right now. We could have 500, 600. We, we have great athletes around here. I played baseball with Paul McAnulty, Major League Baseball player, Josh Towers, professional football players, Ronnie Jenkins, Kerry Colbert. These are our future. These kids can be professionals. I, I ask that you guys just step up to the plate. You know, we're just being neglected. So thank you. Thank you. And finally, as far as the written um, people that have asked to uh, speak, we have Ricardo Mojica. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Ricardo Mojica. Um, our daughter, Mayra Reina, she spoke earlier. We have deep-rooted uh, roots in this in this community, especially with uh, Port Wainimi Little League. Our sons play there, our older sons. Our grandson plays there. Our great-granddaughter plays there. So I also want to thank you all for your time and your consideration as we voice our concerns regarding our beloved Little League. We respectfully request that our snack bar is open back up 
Our board members, coaches, team moms, and countless other volunteers are exactly that. They're volunteers. Countless hours are dedicated for the sole purpose of providing our youth a safe haven to play this beautiful game we call baseball. Our sons played at Port Wainimi Little League in the 90s and through the 2000s. And my wife and I did our fair share of volunteering at the snack bar because if nothing else, it's a valued lesson to our kids to give back. I ask you to find it in the budget to put lights, help with the turf, the field. Um, all these folks here, they help a lot. Go out there and watch a game. Watch the look on these kids when, when they make a good play or they a good out. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing to see. And like Josh Bolo said, it keeps them out of trouble. It keeps them active. That's something that we try to do with our kids is to keep them active, keep them in sports. Because if nothing else, the element that's out there that's negative, it will find them. And this, what we have here with Little League, with youth sports, it helps these kids. I'm telling you, it's beautiful to watch. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Do we have any other uh, written requests, Madam Clerk, at this time? I do not have any other requests. Okay. Um, I just, well, we can't make decisions tonight. It has to go on an agenda item. I want to thank you all for coming and providing your support. I, I mean, I get torn because I have three boys and I was a little league coach myself uh, for a number of years. So um, thank you for all providing your um, input tonight. Uh, you've been heard. Uh, the um, and thank you for providing the vision, the signs. Uh, all the kids who may have helped make these signs. Thank you. Um, Councilman Hernandez would like to say something. I'd also like to thank all of you for coming out tonight and all the hard work, work you made to be here, to organize yourselves, to do the signs. Um, as council members in, in this setting, we can't really respond and tell you and uh, what's happening uh, with your snack bar and what's going to happen, but you can be sure that we will get back to you on that. Um, staff has taken note, and you'll hear from us soon. We will be looking at our capital improvement plan and, and making sure that your concerns are addressed. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we are going to move on to the rest of our meeting. May I have a motion and a second to approve the agenda for tonight? Motion. Second. Okay, so we have a motion by Mayor Pro Tem Martinez and a second by Councilman Gama. May we take roll call? Mayor Pro Tem Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Gama? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. Mayor Rollins? Yes. Pass unanimously. Okay. We're going to now move on to our presentations. We have a special oath of office tonight for uh, one, our newest police officer, and who will be giving the oath of office? Uh, Chief. Good morning, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council, City Staff. It's actually nice to be back to a live meeting, to a full crowd uh, at that. Um, and so uh, before I get started, I'd like to tell everyone that this last Friday, I was actually at a police academy graduation, uh, my first one where I was able to actually provide a certificate of completion to one of our very own officers uh, this past Friday. Uh, for the first time this century uh, that we actually sent someone to the academy and we were able to present them with this certificate. We did have a graduate two years ago, but it happened during COVID, and so there was no ceremony, and that was Kim Mora, and uh, unfortunately, we didn't get to go through that ceremonial experience, uh, but for the first time in my career as a police chief, I was able to do that this past Friday. So with that, if I could have Joseph Tubbs come on up. So while Joseph stands here uh, for you, uh, I'd like to tell everyone a little bit about him. Uh, Joseph started his career with the Port Wainimi Police Department in August of 2021 
as a police officer trainee. He attended the Ventura County Sheriff's Academy from October 2021 until April of 2022 and graduated from the Academy last Friday on April Fool's Day. Prior to being hired by Port Wyneme, Joseph worked as an Amazon driver for More Bro Logistics and also worked as an emergency management student assistant for the Public Safety Department of Cal State University of Channel Islands. Joseph grew up in Monrovia, California and attended Monrovia High School where he played baseball. I bet you he played Little League too. <laughs> After high school, he attended California State University Channel Islands where he earned a bachelor's degree in psychology. Joseph lived in Port Wyneme while attending college and currently lives in Thousand Oaks with his fiance, Cecilia, whom he plans to marry in September of this year. The police academy program is over 900 hours long and is extremely demanding, often leaving little time outside of the academy for anything or anyone else. Spouses, significant others, friends and family sacrifice their time with their loved one for a full six months. That's not to say there aren't light moments. Cecilia's favorite story from the police academy was when Joseph forgot his name tag. And the academy <laughs> staff duct taped his name onto his uniform <laughs> shirt for that day. Joseph is currently attending the 40-hour crisis intervention team training that's being held this week at the police academy. Um, and he will begin his field training program on April uh, 15th uh, of this month, uh, where he will be assigned to A shift, more commonly known as weekend day shift. Uh, in attendance tonight are several of Joseph's family members, uh, Cecilia, his fiance, uh, her grandmother, Patricia Watt Haskins, Cecilia's parents, Alex and Julie Valdez, and Joseph's parents, James and Jennifer Tubbs, as well as his grandfather, James Tubbs. So please join me in welcoming Officer Joseph Tubbs to the Port Wyneme Police Department and the City of Port Wyneme. So if I could have Cecilia come on up here. Okay, and that'll conclude our presentation. Thank you very much. Well, welcome aboard to what we all feel is perhaps one of the finest departments in California. And I'm sure you're going to be a valuable asset to it. Thank you. Mr. Robbins. Yes. Um, Councilman Gama. Congratulations, uh, Officer Tubbs, and congratulations on your engagement. And I want to tell you that I met your family, your grandpa, your parents, your in-laws before this meeting, and they're very proud of you. They're very, very nice and charming people, and I welcome you to protecting and serving the city of Port Wyneme. Thank you. 
I'd also like to welcome you, Officer Tubbs, and congratulate you on your accomplishment. I know going through the academy is no easy feat. I worked for the Sheriff's Department for 16 years. I was not a sworn uh, officer, but I've, I've seen uh, what they go through, and it's, it's, it's quite a mission. So thank you so much for choosing Fort Wainimi. We're happy to have you here. Yes, I want to say congratulations as well. I'm, I know what you're about to go through, as my husband is a 30-year, almost 30 years in Wainimi, and you'll be on his shift, I hear. So, <laughs> so get Ooh. ready for the real training. <laughs> so congratulations to you. Okay, well, we will now move on to our next agenda item, and that's an update by the Oxnard Harbor District. Uh, Ms. Kristen Deckis. Ms. Good afternoon. Good evening, Hi. I guess now, right? That's right. So we have a PowerPoint. Does it come up on your yes. uh, yes. screens? Okay. I hope so. Well, Chief why, said morning. <laughs> I know. I we're, we're moving yeah. along. We're getting to evening. It's not well, but I'll be turning okay. that way. <laughs> okay, I'll just point out the team that I have with me uh, this evening. I have Miguel, uh, Miguel Rodriguez, our community manager, Paul Lizette, who's our uh, financial analyst, and uh, Austin Young, who is our director of finance here to help answer any questions you may have about the court today. Um, so we'll zip through this. I know a lot of you have been out there. It's a pleasure to be in front of you. And, um, and thank you, Mayor and, and council members for having us out today. It is nice to be at the first public meeting in a long time. We are still behind the computer screen right now. So we'll see when we open back up. But it is great to be here this evening. Um, so let's see how this works. Um, as you know, this is our board of elected harbor commissioners. Um, they are uh, grateful that I'm able to come tonight and talk to you and talk about some of the things that we've been doing together as a court and city team. I think we've made a lot of strides in doing some great work together. Um, and they thank you for your leadership and the opportunity to be here this evening. Just a quick reminder here on our vision and mission statement. Um, the way the port rolls, when we collect revenue, we don't get money from the tax payer. It comes in through the coffers of the port from our customers and the business that we do. So we have to run like a very prudent business um, enterprise. But once the funds are inside the walls of the port, because we're a special district of the state of California governed by these five elected harbor commissioners, we're actually owned by you, the public. Um, so we are your port. And our mission is not to become a rich port, but to enrich our community and create economic and social good by having access to global trade. So just kind of put the format of who we are and what our real DNA is all about. So some wow factors here. In the midst of the <coughs> supply chain um, crisis, we're just kind of thought I'd let you know what's going on with your port. We're popping. Um, we're actually moving now $11.4 billion worth of uh, cargo. We are the number one banana import port on the West Coast, number four in the state of California. So it's LA, Long Beach, Oakland, us. So we out outperform San Diego now when it comes to cargo movement. We're number six on the entire West Co uh, Coast, um, now outperforming both the ports of Boston and the ports of or uh, Portland, Oregon. Number one, or number, excuse me, six auto port in the nation, and we're in the top 10% of all of our nation's seaports. So um, that's the story of how um, we sit in the lens of, of global trade. Since 2012, our cargo has gone up 33%, so our business is strong and the port is healthy. What does that mean to the city when we do well? As you know, we have our revenue sharing agreements, and they're kind of broken down into these terms. Um, but when we make money, we are able to bring funds through our revenue sharing agreements to you. So since inception in 1983, we brought $32 million to the city of Port Wanimi. Um, and then these are the, the breakout of the different agreements that have brought those funds into the city. So again, just another snapshot of when the port performs highly, the city revenues perform nicely. So our cargo is up 33% since the last decade. Your revenues are up 91%. It's a good story. Another way of looking at it, our operating revenue is up 68% since 2012 your port revenue is up 91%. So the better we perform, you actually outperform the, the, the rate that, uh, of our revenues, just kind of how the, the formulas work. And I have the mathematician over here that can help explain that. <laughs> um, also, we're able to partner up with the city and our police department. And uh, I guess the new uh, gentleman left. I don't know if he'll be out to the port and provide some of the security. But over the years, um, we've been able to bring about $1.6 million in Homeland Security grant funds to the port um, 
FEMA program, the, the federal grant program that we get port security grants for. So that has been proven to be a win-win. And I think another uh, round is coming out. So we'll be able to partner up with the PHPD and see what we can bring in terms of some money to support security issues. Um, some other stats out there um, in terms of the revenues that come in through the port and the customers that we have here, we actually bring a lot of tax revenue uh, through the business operators to the community. So in your case, you get $4.2 million through the tax, local tax impacts of the customers and people that work at the port. And this is from a study performed by um, John Martin, who's an expert in our arena and does several of these economic impact studies for ports around the globe. Again, another snapshot of when the port does well, also our community goes well, it goes back to that creating economic and social good. So since 2013, with our robust gro uh, growth, we've seen jobs increase 99%. In fact, we make up 6% of Ventura County's workforce now, the fourth largest employer in the county. Tax revenue has grown 224%, and total economic output is up four, um, four, uh, excuse me, 175%, and we now make up 4% of Ventura County's GDP. So look at those numbers. We've gone from 800 million to over 2.2 billion dollar economic impact in 10 years. Uh, direct jobs, drilling it down a little bit further, you can see over 340 people can call Port Winnie Home, also call the Port of Winnie Home, and, and play and work here. Um, our direct job growth is up 14 percent since 2018, and the current count is um, 2,900 plus direct jobs related to trade-related commerce. So some quick updates for you. I'm sure you've been watching on the news. The supply chain is still very disrupted. Um, I was looking at the maritime reports today, and there are about 56 vessels still outside the coast of LA Long Beach. So it's lightening up. That's a record low, actually. They went as high as 100, but still there is a lot of disruption. And they don't think this is really going to shift until there's some changes in spending patterns by US consumers, meaning we get back to service-oriented purchases as opposed to good-oriented pur purchases where we're just bringing more and more things in from Asia. So the story during COVID has been that e-commerce is up 39%, and your ports uh, in LA and Long Beach actually moved 42% of the cargo from Asia into this country to service um, the United States of America. So that's a lot of cargo going through there with this kind of tick up. And so what you're seeing is just an eight-line highway full of cargo trying to get its way to the states through a straw. It's really the best way to explain it. And you've seen all this congestion here, but what we commit to you and our communities to be the port that continues to move goods, find solutions, but not create congestion, and that's our gate. <laughs> and if you drive by it any day, that's what you're going to see. And we're going to not allow trucks to line up in city streets and block driveways, and people can't get to work, because that's what's happening in LA and Long Beach. And so how are we able to do that? One, we've been partnering up a lot with our local Navy. We have a joint use program over there. And in lieu of paying rent, we pay in infrastructure improvement projects when we use wharfs and 54 acres of real estate on the base side. And then also we have a customer over there named Globus, which is uh, the Hyundai and Kia manufacturer. And they also pay for 90 acres of rent. In lieu of paying rent, they also pay in infrastructure improvements. So combined, we've brought the Navy base here locally close to $66 million in the last five years. Um, through these public-public-private win relationships. So we have that institutional fabric there already to mobilize and use the real estate on the base to support some of the supply chain congestion issues, and they've really been stepping up and allowing us to plant some containers over there. I believe, Mayor, you came to the press event when we had FedEx, and the reason this one penciled out is because we looked at FedEx and said, we're not going to do business with you if you don't have a trucker, you don't have a chassis, you don't have a yard to take this stuff and you need a ship, and you, you have to work out all these details in the supply chain so there's no choke points and we don't have congestion. Well, FedEx got it done. They rolled those containers off our docks in 72 hours. They got their second ship in now, and we're going to be looking to do a long-term contract with them. They are bringing cargo out of Asia and a lot of time-sensitive commodities like med medical supplies and those sorts of things. So this is working out well, and that's the type of relationships and the businesses that we'll work with to support the city and the community. So what has the supply chain done to Winnie? And you saw the gate, it's empty. But yes, our, um, our containers are up 117%, our exports are up 200%, our imports are 123%, and what we call project cargo high and heavy is up 143%. 
and this is just the first half of this fiscal year that these numbers are coming through. So this really does tra uh, translate into serious revenue that will be coming to the city in, in the future through these revenue sharing agreements. One area where we've noticed a little bit of a weak spot is cars. You've probably read about it in the news. This chip is a very real issue. Um, your compete these chips goes in cars because cars are smart, so it's competing with refrigerators and laptops and all the things that we've been using in a virtual world. Um, so they, they are very, there is a great lull in production of automobiles as a result of this. I don't know, my daughter just totaled her car and it's not fun to have to go out and buy one right now um, because they're short on supply. In fact, four out of every five cars for some of our customers are already sold by the time they got here. That was never the case before. You always had surplus inventory. So it's really an interesting phenomenon what's happening. And our auto business is down 16, excuse me, 19% because of this chip issue. But because we've been performing so well on the container side of the house and project cargo side of the house, our revenue is actually up 21%. So it's just a really interesting dynamic when you consider cars traditionally made up 50% of our revenue. Now that's the case with containers. So some interesting changes and, and shifts that we're seeing. A couple other highlights for you. Um, we did work with the Ventura County Transportation Committee on a freight study. I think you're aware of this. This has been put out. They were, are more than happy. I know they're going out to city councils and giving presentations. They came out and debriefed our commission. But the bottom line is that 23% of the trucks on the trade corridor, which goes from the Port Winnie Gate, the 101, are trucks affiliated with trade. Another way of saying that is 77% of the trucks on that corridor are not affiliated with the port. So when we look at some of the, you know, the questions that we've had around risk and how we make sure truck traffic is running safely there, just those are the stats. You know, that 23 port traffic, uh, that tr truck traffic is trucks. And then when you look at the whole county, we make up 0.6% of the total truck trips in the, in the county. So it's just kind of demystifying the real impacts of truck traffic. And of course, we are open the ears if we want to do more studies around safety. And I know my team over here in Miguel's shop is working with the trucking community to get clean trucks, hydrogen trucks, electric trucks. So we're going to have to have electric trucks by 2035. So working on all those agendas, but just wanted to come in and kind of de demystify what trucks really mean to the port and community. Um, there's been some questions about noise um, from port operations. And we've performed now two noise studies. They cost us about $40,000. And from these tests, we've actually put the equipment and people overnight to hear the noises. And we're well below the 65 decibel allowance in the city ordinance. Um, and to give some perspective, 48 is sort of a, a normal conversation. I'm, I'm not an expert in sound, so if you want to have the sound <laughs> expert come in, but this is the layman's term analysis that they shared with me. So 60 decibels of noise it converts to like a normal conversation and a car horn measures at 110. So when we see 48, you can kind of give some context to what noise is really happening there. And of course, we're, we are willing and have been going out to the HOAs and talking about the studies with them and also understanding that we do have impacts and are open-minded and looking at ways that we can continue to bring down the noise impacts but, and, excuse me, and do what we can there. But we are just wanted you to be aware we are within city limits on, or, on, on your ordinance. There's been some questions recently about some of the crossings um, and, and being in a good state of repair. So g and is going to come out this week and meet with the city. I think it's Roy, um, Council Member Dama. Uh, is Roy, his last name, anybody know? Peter Azez? Peter Azez? Do you know Roy? Well, g and is meeting with someone from your public works department this week to go out and evaluate all of the crossings um, to make sure they're in a state of good repair. So we'll settle that and make sure it gets fixed. Air quality monitoring, um, the community came out to us and they asked us, they w said they want to know about our air. We want to know about our air. What, what are we breathing here? So we went out and we put a reference grade um, air quality monitor on the Haycox Elementary School and we are measuring air. So we collect data every second, every day, and we have all this data now. We're going to be sharing it, posting it on our website. Long story short, what we learn is in the winter, when the wind blows from the north, the air tends to be inferior to when it's blowing off the coast in the summer. So the breeze from the water is actually bringing us good air. Uh, but we will continue to share that in real time. Um, with all the baseball kids in here, 
thinking of community benefit fund, this could be a perfect marriage for that, right? So we'll bring that into our government relations needs and see if there's a nexus for the court and the city to support the Little League. Um, but as you know, this is, uh, I'm gonna, our community benefit funds, these are two recent uh, events and we commit to working with Brick and the team and Scott has been floating around to make sure that we really celebrate this fund and that we're getting out that PR piece of it, but really doing good, meaningful, impactful work in the community. Um, this is a snapshot of, we got there, right? We worked through these various meetings and now we have this great list of projects and we're gonna calendar out all the upcoming ribbon cuttings around these um, community-based events. Where are we now? So we have put into the pot over, since its inception, I mean, excuse me, 872 plus thousand dollars. Everything has been voted that is able to be voted. So the next step with the Community Development Fund, we are forecasting this year's allocation to be about $122,000. And starting July 1, we'll go through our meeting processes and we have a 180 day window to allocate next fiscal year's funding. So we'll get through those committee meetings and I talk about what projects we have to form, we have a process in place. So I think we're in a good place to continue to do good work in the community through this mechanism. Um, our leadership has committed to being a decarbonized port. So we actually, through a formal resolution at our November 15, 21 meeting, um, adopted a resolution to be a zero emission port. So we have received a $200,000 grant from the California Energy Commission and we are using that fund to build our blueprint to zero emissions. We just don't wanna go out there and say, oh, we're gonna do it by then, this date and put some kind of go state out there. We really wanna know how we're gonna do it, what the, what the mix of fuel is gonna be and how mature is the technology and how can we get there. We all as ports are regulated by the state to convert to zero emissions in certain areas by 2035. So we'll have to meet those commitments, but we wanna beat them. Um, and so hopefully this, this blueprint will help us build that pathway. Oh, we also got, excuse me, I went the wrong way. We also got a um, seven and a half million dollar project going um, so we can build the backbone infrastructure into the port so we can start plugging in our cranes. So that should come online over the next eight months. And very important, um, and this is my closing slide. Again, it comes back to creating that economic and social good. This is a really important pillar as we're rolling out our strategic plan, which we hope to have done by the end of the fiscal year. But our goal is to really create social equity, create pipelines and workforce development for the people that live here in our communities. Um, this is a slide that Miguel uh, artfully put together, but the story is we don't want just our, our people here to have a ticket at the game. We want them to be playing in the game, not only playing in the game, knowing the rules of the game and how to win the game. So that's our goal to really uplift our community through the op opportunities and job growth at the port. Um, we have turned the lights back on and we're doing our field trips. So we've done 120, field trips a year normally for our elementary schools and youth. So the doors are back open and, and Miguel's shop is also launching um, these tours. And it's fun to see the kids back out there. I think we have a hundred coming on Friday. So they're, they're happening. So it's been fun. We also have our, uh, our global trade and logistics class. I know uh, Council Member Gama has participated in those. We have a, a, another class on tomorrow with uh, FedEx is actually gonna come out and teach the kids. We got a big class this year. We have 27 students. And then the excelling student um, gets a paid internship with the port and we have an intern working with us now through this program. So that's been real fun. And then finally on the COVID front, we were able to do instead of our banana festival, the numbers are out. We did about 60 community drives, 1.1 million pounds of produce from our customer Del Monte went into the hands of our community members and we've reached 42,000 plus families through those community drives. And hats off to Miguel for the good work that he did there. And that is our update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for the uh, presentation. And uh, it looks like you're touching a lot of the bases on making the communities better and um, making us healthy and making us feel safe. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to call on some of the councilmen to have some questions. Councilman Gama. Thank you for the presentation and what's really cool about the port logistics class is that uh, this is my seventh year of teaching my section and I believe uh, Drew was in the first class that I spoke. That's cool. Yeah. Shows you how it works. Yeah. <laughs> Drew Rodriguez. So uh, yeah, he, he, right. Um, so every now and then a member of the community will say, hey, aren't the trucks supposed to use exclusively Rice Road? Is that true or not true? Because I don't know if it is, but I do know I think the the rice connection to the 101 was 
part of some kind of program? On the books for both the port and the Navy, the port intermodal corridor and access route, the, the primary route is Portland Navy Road down to Rice and out to the 101. The Victoria Gate is considered the contingency part of the strategic port corridor, okay. but there's no mandate that they can't deviate from those routes. And, and then I, I notice trucks come out of the Sunkiss Gate sometimes and they either go right or left depending on probably where they're going. So so then there is no mandate. Okay, that's there's basic no, my, no And I uh, really appreciate the effort going on on those crossing, rail crossings. They're, yeah. They're, yeah, they're failing or and you guys are on top of it and I really appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Councilman Hernandez. Thank you so much for being here tonight. You and your staff are always welcome and we appreciate seeing you. Um, I wanted to ask you about the sales revenue and how that actually, the, how that works. My, I don't have the financial background or don't understand how that really, um, how sales revenue really appears like in o city of Oxnard or Wainimi based on the, the port's business. Can you maybe yes, explain that a little bit better? Yes, I can give you a highlight better? and I can also give you an offer. So the highlight um, is that they use the tax base of the businesses that are in the port and the percentage that would go to the port of Winnie based on the taxes they pay. So they can figure that out. So the economists can figure it out. It's mm -hmm. also based on your household. So you have 340 people that live here that pay taxes. They live here for their work at the port. So they'll use that. And then there's a trickle down effect from the sales and, and things that happen in, in your, in Anna Cap Cappuccino, right? Or something like that. There's a tax revenue from those sales that go into the city. But what I can offer is that John Martin, who is the consultant that did this project, can come out and present the study to you. I think that'd be very he, interesting. He would like that. He could really you know, nail it for you. Yeah, yeah. to learn that. <laughs> because the revenue sharing agreements, yeah. those are difficult in themselves to, mm -hmm. to understand. So I, you know, I like to see things kind of diagrammed out. That would be helpful for me, at least. I don't know about the rest of the council. But that, you know, I'm happy to set that up. And, and he would be the one to articulate the economic study and the tax revenues, and then of course the revenue sharing agreements, we can are happy to walk through those with you and kind of show you the breakouts by each agreement. Yeah, and we, I know we have a good summary yeah. also that our yeah. uh, city attorney provided to us. Um, another question I have, how is your daughter? I hope she's okay. <laughs> she is, thank okay. you for asking. She is, the car is not, but she's okay. <laughs> okay, and then um, I would really like to have a copy of the presentation because we do get questions about port operations and port revenues and so if we could get a copy and have that at our fingertips when we need it be very helpful of course. Thank thanks you. again for being here thank you Councilman. council person Jerez. yes thank you for the presentation it was very informative and a lot of good information you gave i have a question about the supply chain um, interruption when Long Beach and all the other ports were shut down for some reason and the, the ships were sitting out at sea. You were able to open up and allow some ships to come in to relieve that issue. Is that correct? So what we did is that I, I think cargo is running away from LA and Long Beach right now just because it's so congestion. So we didn't actually take <laughs> ships out of line in, in LA and Long Beach per se, but you have a lot of big box retailers that are now calling Port of Winnie directly and they want to rent their own ships and put their and get control of the supply chain and put their own cargo on those supply chain. Example is Home Depot, right? They they don't want to just jump on the big bus anymore, like the huge ocean carriers. They'd rather rent or, or lease smaller ships and just have their own cargo on there and, and control the supply chain and bring it in on their own. And so those are the businesses and types of businesses that we're talking to. But again, we're not going to allow that cargo to come through unless they really have all of their I's dotted. And that's what's kind of nice about the Port of Winnie and that we serve operate a little bit more like an operating port. So we go into direct contract with the ocean carriers in LA and Long Beach. They're really landlord ports. And so the private terminals are the ones that line up the business and they're just going to take cargo and they don't care that it sits there because they're making so much money. Um, so it's become very lucrative. Uh, to give you an ex example of how much the ocean shipping carriers are making right now, they used to get around $8,000 a container for bringing it into the country. Now it's around $20,000. It's just there's so, such a premium um, put on, on shipping right now because they're just running back to Asia and get more and get more, and they're making all of this money on these import boxes. And, of course, they're going to take them up in L.A. and Long Beach because they're making all that money. But for us, we have the ability to say no when it doesn't make sense. Well, you did present an interesting 
picture that I never really thought about before, the pictures of the two, three ports and the backup of cargo waiting in line. I, I never really put that in per to, into perspective until you showed that picture. That is great to see that we don't have that issue here. So thank you. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Kristen, thank you for being here tonight. Uh, the pie chart where it showed, um, I think it was like Oxnard, 19 million, and Wainimi, 4 million, that's the, the offer that you have, that, that you gave? Are they going to explain that uh, Yeah, they chart? can explain that. So Oxnard's just a bigger city, and if you think about it, they, they like BMW and WWL, have like 65 acres, 35 acres of real estate in Oxnard, so they pay property taxes on those businesses, which is draws up the numbers for Oxnard. And they have more people that work here. So it's like 1,500 plus people that live in the city of Oxnard work, um, live in Oxnard, and 340 live here. So you're going to, it's just going to pencil out because it's a bigger community. They're going to get more on that side of the equation, but they don't have revenue sharing agreements with us. So you get that funding directly through the port's revenues. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Rollins, may I ask one more question? Certainly. The mega ship versus the the container ship that comes in the port Wainimi, I've, I've always tried to count the containers and figure out how much the ones that come to port of Wainimi carry. So is it true that the megas carry 10,000? So right now they have what they, they call them TEUs, 20 foot equivalents. And so uh, a t a 18,000 TU ship will go through LA and Long Beach and that carries 9,000 containers. 9,000. Yeah, and a, a container ship that comes through the port of Wanini, somewhere around a 2,500, 2,400 TE ship, they can carry as much as 1,200. Our banana customers actually are, they have about 800 containers on them, 600 containers on them. It all varies, but the and capability of the port would not exceed 2,500 TE. But even at 800, that's a lot of containers per ship. I try to count it and it's, it's so they must go under deck quite. Yes, they do. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. but you want to come out and jump on a ship? We can make that happen. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and the way we Love describe to it too, we describe it, those big those big ships as the bus, and, and Winimi offers the taxi or the limousine service, and people are starting to want to pay a little bit more money to make sure there's predictability in the supply chain. Well, thank you. I have a few questions. Um, I know that we have the community benefit fund that. Uh, benefits the city of Port Wainimi. And on how much money, I know you do a lot of other different things throughout Ventura County from a social equity and uh, food services and those types of things. How, how much money do you set aside or do you have a formula as far as how much money you set aside for all of those other types of things throughout the county? So the community benefit fund came out of the settlement agreement where $100,000 a year goes to this fund and we collectively decide how to invest that money if the port makes more than $13 million a year. So that's how that works. Then we have visioning workshops with our board to look at some of the needs in the community and figure out what the budget will be for any given year for sponsorships to support community programs. So through that, we've done usually around $300,000 a year. And then we also have done um, $100,000 uh, was allocated to community work and community drives through the board to redirect money that otherwise may have gone to the Banana Festival and other events. Okay. Uh, second question regarding the railroad that you brought up. Um, who, who maintains the actual physical railroad? Like not so much the rail tracks, but like the periphery, you know, the 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 ground around it, or the walls and those types of things. Yeah, Genesee in Wyoming is tasked through their agreement with us to maintain that property, the, the easement property outside of the railroad itself. So if there's trees that need trimming that are on their property, it would be incumbent on them to do that, general landscaping. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, yeah, I'm, it's probably getting too much into the weeds, but it actually is the weeds. So the, mm -hmm. the weeds and the trash or things that accumulate on those tracks, um, who is Genesee responsible Genesee for that? Genesee and Matt Doman is the lead person. They're supposed to be coming out this week, so if there's some problem areas you want them to look at, I think the timing is right now to, to kind of look at certain things. I know there's been some discussion about graffiti on the walls, which are really not on the property of the port, but I think Rick uh, had talked about, and the city manager talked about building a task force, if one doesn't exist already, that we could jump on board with to help address some of those concerns around maintaining the railway and some of the graffiti along the walls that has happened. I'm happy to join forces on that front. And then another question. So this has been probably a pretty chaotic out of the ordinary kind of years as far as commerce. 
as you look forward, say, in the next three years, how do you see your model changing or your goals as far as what you'd like to see the port do? So we're in the midst of updating our strategic 2030 plan, and what we're trying to do is do enhancements inside the gate and then complement those with expansion projects outside the gate, all through open, transparent processes to be able to build more port commerce that would translate directly into more jobs. Um, if we could get it done working with our local communities, we think we could grow as many as 4,000 jobs and really create an interface between the youth of our community up through our local colleges and into the pipeline of, of the port. So that's the ultimate goal, to grow so we can bring more. It, it's really interesting right now, if you look at our GDP in our county, it's anemic. And the only area where our economy is growing is in trade and transportation. And so we have this port right here in our backyard and we have the opportunity to really support and grow it so that we can create those, uh, those social equity and economic opportunities for the people of the community. So that's the ultimate goal. Um, in, in a nutshell, on what do I see happening in the three, next three years in the supply chain, there's a few dynamics. One, will consumer patterns change and we'll buy less stuff and, and more services again. Now you have a war in play and that does funny things to the supply chain. Believe it or not, cargo that was meant for Russia could actually get diverted here. You don't really know how that will all, all unfold. Um, and then we may have some recessionary moments here if we tighten the Fed and the interest rates. So there's a lot in play and it's really hard, again, to look in that crystal ball and figure out what's gonna happen. But our goal is to grow and do so responsibly with our community and with environmental stewardship, meaning go to zero emissions. This may simplify it. Are you like, do you think you're at 80% capacity 90 percent capacity or, or close to 100 i it don't know it would really be hard to say but if we built a parking structure inside the gate by way of example it's a grant that we're pursuing um you could double our automotive business right so there's opportunities to really grow the port um so it's you know unless we work hand in hand together though and identify the outside of the port gate terminals and have them synchronized with inside the gate infrastructure improvements you know, we probably now could do another 10% as what we are today, right? But we could probably do 30% if we're able to put these projects to go into the green light mode. So finally, any thoughts on the Banana Festival? It's coming back. Okay. It's gonna come back. Last week in September, we're on. So. Well, well, thank you again right. thank for you. making a great presentation. Really appreciate your time this evening. Thank you so thank much. You. So now we're going to move on to the consent agenda. I'm going to uh, read the titles. Uh, I'm sorry, we've got one more. I'm sorry, that's right, you're right. Landscape design guidelines, yes. Push it in real quick. I didn't want to leave you out, Tony. Oh, thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you, Mayor, Council. Uh, good evening to all. Uh, this is a brief, probably the first of two uh, landscape design guidelines presentations. And this evening's uh, presentation is really just about what it is right now and where, where we are and to give you a preview of where we're be going in the near future at least. So this is a uh, cover of the design guidelines as it exists right now. It's not very exciting, but uh, that's what we have. They were established back in 1993. And they're a very comprehensive uh, set of guidelines uh, that provide guidance not only for city landscaping projects, such as our street themes and whatnot, but also for plan development and its private uh, projects. So with community development, my team uh, works with the private developers and the public works folks uh, work with the city projects uh, for the design guidelines. I'm not gonna go through that table of contents. I just wanted to show you that it's, it's fairly comprehensive. We have about over, I'd say a little over 100 pages worth of guidelines in that document. And what it basically does in a nutshell, it has provided a recommended plant palette for the city. As we know, the floral trees are uh, little teal colored uh, bollards, are, are signs and whatnot throughout the community. Um, 
And it also submit, uh, provides submittal requirements for private developers uh, for the preliminary, as well as their final landscape plans. So say a new development comes to you, for instance, the Habitat Project it has a preliminary landscape plan that comes through that just basically shows the, uh, the schematics. And then during the construction phase, the uh, applicants then put together a final landscape plan with all of the irrigation, the planting specs, and whatnot. Um, our standards also provide, or our guidelines also provide standards for maintenance and replacement. Uh, so for instance, you know, 30 years down the road when the HOA's trees start failing, uh, the guidelines provide uh, assistance with that along with our zoning guidelines. <coughs> so uh, as I mentioned, there are also standards for our theme bollards, light standards, signage and decorative paving uh, in the guidelines, and these are some examples of that. You know, the, uh, the sign posts up on the top there, and then even uh, irrigation specs, uh, how to plant a tree, uh, those are all included within our guidelines. So overall, basically, our guidelines are very good. They're very detailed. However, they're a little outdated. Um, as you all know, at this point, you've been hearing, for instance, our, uh, our public comments uh, this afternoon. Uh, we need to really update our guidelines to deal with drought tolerant requirements, not only that are state mandated, but also are, would meet the, the needs of our, our city, our, our landscape, uh, our, our climate and whatnot. So um, what we're looking at doing at this point is to update these guidelines here in the near future. And so what the next steps are going to be, uh, first is to come back to you, uh, council, to get some uh, direction on the scope of what these guidelines should contain. Are they a simple update where we you know, look at the plant palette and maybe we uh, you know, bring in the state's requirements and whatnot? Or do we want to do a whole full-fledged new rebranding landscape theme, new signs, whatnot? So something for you guys to think about right now, and we'll discuss it later in a more formal uh, business item type of discussion. Um, and of course, that's going to affect the budget, uh, but we'll get there when we get to our next meeting. Uh, hopefully, they'll be coming up in the next month or two. Uh, and then what we'll do is after that meeting, uh, I'll go ahead and prepare a request for proposals, or RFP, and uh, send that out to landscape architects in the, in the area and also statewide. We'll publish it on the city's website like we always do. And then uh, we'll go ahead and hire a landscape architect based on the proposals that we get in. And then we'll go ahead and work with the, the landscape architect to discuss the actual park scope, what kind of public process, and outreach we're going to have, much like we did with the parks master plan and the general plan projects uh, after we got our consultants on board. So when we kind of whittled down exactly what the process was going to be. Then we'll go ahead and, and revise the guidelines and bring them back to you eventually for uh, approval. So that's basically in a, in a nutshell. Uh, again, we've got a good set of guidelines, but they are definitely outdated and uh, so the next steps again will be coming back to have further discussion about where exactly we should take our, our guidelines update project. Okay, if you have any questions. Uh, well, we'll we have, uh, we give public comments, I think, first. So I think I oversaw that we do have a public comment that we want to hear from. Okay, so we have a public comment. You have three minutes to speak, and it will be Mr. Scrivener. Good evening, Mayor, Councilman, <coughs> Council People, excuse me. <coughs> I've been sitting and left, lost my voice. Um, I'm the president of Surfside Village Homeowners Association, and we have had some major tree problems, as almost every um, homeowners association in the city has had. And this dates back a long time ago when the, the original landscape uh, design of all these places was created, probably back in the 70s and 80s. Um, 40 years later, we've got massive tree problems that are breaking up infrastructure, um, costing us a fortune, and um, we need some help. Uh, the, the, the costs associated with fixing all of this are astronomical. It's actually costing us thousands of dollars per homeowner in Suicide Village to, man to fix some of this stuff. And uh, we're still going back and forth with uh, Mr. Stewart on a plan, hopefully, to move forward. Um, at this point, we've, um, we're stuck between uh, this tree replacement, um, removal and replacement standard, which isn't going to work, and then having to come up with a whole new landscape plan. 
which is extremely costly and probably is going to cost us um, at least four thousand dollars for a major uh, i forget the, the term of it but um there's nothing here but major major modification major modification right uh as well as permits for all the trees to be taken in and, you know if we finally get that done so we've gone from no uh, cost for a permit for a tree to 210 dollars for five trees in Surfside Village, we probably have 100 trees that are going to have to come out of there or we're going to close it up. Um, the, the situation we're in is I've had several landscape people come out with, for bids, and they brought arborists with them, and they just roll their eyes with what has happened. Because we have ficus trees that, if you've been to downtown Ventura and see the beautiful ficus trees there in parks, the canopy on them is probably 80 to 100 feet across. We got those trees planted 18 inches from driveways and sidewalks and it's tearing the whole place up. So uh, what I'm asking for, I guess, is basically to take a look at the fees associated with this uh, and help work, help us resolve this. I know that several other associations have the same issue going on. Uh, and there's a lot of consternation out there. So that's, that's all I'd like to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. At this point, we'll have some council comments. Um, Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for the presentation. Um, so, I know, we, well, ever since I got elected, I've been bringing up the coral tree, the coral tree, and, and it, it appears that we finally have consolidated around the idea that coral tree is bad. And then with this new law, um, drought tolerant trees, I think we've realized that the time for the coral tree may be up in the city of our city. Um, and so before we revamp our tree palette to go dr drought tolerant, our, for example, is habitat for humanity going to be forced to plant a coral tree? Uh, no, they won't. Okay. Now, is that because of their landscape design or because the city backed off? Well, actually, we never had it brought to us, but as you may recall, their lots are very small. Okay. And so they're just not suitable to plant a tree of that size. Right. right. So looking down the street, though, I think we all agree. Um, I visited several HOAs that, um, and I get them all mixed up, but the, the development on Pleasant Valley that's next to Emerald Perspective, Harbor Walk. Harbor Walk. Of a walk. Yeah, it, it, it's it's one of the walks. Yeah. <laughs> so you know they have trees that are 15 years old and they're already causing major major damage. And so um, my point being is that how it, it appears to me that it's time for us to get on this and really think it through, get community participation, and try and come up with a better way moving forward. And um, so th that's my ask tonight is that we hopefully can get aggressive on moving forward on this because we are um, my HOA for example is is a we have an assessment now just to deal with the trees several thousand per homeowner um, and, the, and the second question I have is that does this landscape plan deal with the mediums um, because currently it appears that the mediums which are are staffed with uh, eucalyptus trees it appears that the water's been turned off or that they're not getting water it's just and so i'm wondering is that happening because of this state law and then what is going to be our plan to deal with those trees before they start failing or or is that even in your department well technically it's not but i can speak to a couple of those points um the state did cut back on uh watering of the landscape mediums for instance and they do want drought tolerant now. For instance, the city I live in too, all the nice grassy turfy mediums are no longer in existence. Um, but they, uh, with regard to, again, this project, you're right again that we do need to get this moving forward. Um, but uh, part of that will be a good question for the landscape designer that comes in, as well as assistance, assistance through uh, public works on how to address not only our private development, but also our city. Uh, you know, landscape mediums, the corners right out here in front of City Hall, for instance. So that those all need to be looked at as part of the scope for this upcoming project. 
Yeah, okay. Um, really, okay, thank you. Council person Hernandez. Thank you, Mr. Stewart, for your presentation and congratulations again on your award, um, you and your staff on the general plan. It's thank quite you. remarkable um, acknowledgement. Um, I had a question about the tree replacement policy. Is is the policy such that when you a tree is removed for whatever reason, it has to be replaced by the same kind of tree, or is it replaced? Can it be replaced by another type of tree? It can be replaced by a different uh, species of tree that's within the landscape uh, palette for for that development, basically. Um, but we don't require. A you know like for like for instance if the coral tree comes out and the new coral tree is not suitable for that location or any location <laughs> around it we don't require that in fact we don't even require it necessarily to be put right in that exact location if again that location is not suitable uh, and, and we have found that quite a few of our developments were over planted um, have tight spaces and so you know there are areas elsewhere of the development to plant a new tree a replacement tree but we don't necessarily require it to go right back into the same spot uh, if you don't think that. Okay. Yeah, we have a lot of um, coral trees in Las Palomas and actually had one come down. And I don't consider them bad trees. Um, in fact, I think in our 1993 design guidelines, they are the signature tree for our city, and they are quite beautiful. But what I understood from the tree that went down in our complex in Las Palomas, uh, several months ago, it, it was the planting, it was how they planted those trees, that they planted them together, like multiple trees together in one hole. And that was really, that's really the source of the problem with those trees. It was how they were planted. Is there, is there any truth to that? Because we were told by an arborist who does consulting throughout yeah, the city. Right, our own arborist at this point has also told me the same thing where back in the 80s, it was common for the nurseries to put three little trees together and sell them as one big tree. Uh, the problem is, you know, 20 years down the road, uh, the more uh, aggressive tree within that tree, for instance, will choke out the other ones. And so all of a sudden you have failure because part of what was its own tree has been choked to death basically by mm -hmm. the other trees on that bin. And so that's, that's basically what has caused that. Nowadays, coral trees are single trees. And so they don't have the same uh, issues down the line that those do. But the problem here in the city is a lot of our trees are those those multi uh, coral trees, mm, so okay. to speak. Yeah. Our complex is going through similar problems with the, with gr the growing trees. I guess the trees, they, they grow bigger and they develop a root system. Some are uplifting my outdoor deck. Um, so I don't think it's just coral trees that are causing the uh, problems for many of us. But um, I'm hoping that we can come up with a workable solution for um, for our HOAs and for our residents. And I do think that it's going to be um, in our best interest to, to look at drought um, tolerant trees, considering the water, what's happening with our, our water and the future of water here in, in Ventura County in California. So uh, I look forward to working on that with you. Thank you. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions. Um, uh, I applaud that you're looking towards the future as far as um, changing the plant palette. I think throughout Southern California, I think the uh, two biggest um, problems which may not have been foreseen is like the ficus tree and the um, coral trees. And um, my past experience in parks and recreation was that a developer would come in and they wanted those communities to, to sell the homes to have that instant wow factor where they had a very lush environment. Not, and once they made the sell, they weren't, weren't necessarily looking 20, 30, 40 years into the future as to the effects of those trees. And so um, I think it's real. The other, the other concern, well, along with that, is that they would overgrow that to give that lush environment. And in nature, those trees are meant to have a large swath of area to be able to grow healthy and uh, that when you artificially put them in small areas, you have problems. So uh, I, I look forward to um, having a, a good, robust discussion when you move forward as far as like the potential plans and that we let all the various different HOAs that are affected by it be very much involved in that. 
Well, thank, thank you for you. your presentation. Thank you. So now, oh gosh, life. I thought I was going to need some glasses pretty soon. Um, I am now going to read the consent agenda items. Um, number one, uh, approve the minutes of the City Council regular meeting of March 21st, 2022, and the special council meeting of March 25th, 2022. The recommendation is to approve the regular and the special meeting minutes. Number five is to receive and file the financial disbursements for March 15th, 2022 through March 29th, 2022. The recommendation is to receive and file the disbursements. And number six, the first amendment to the unit first contract. The recommendation is to authorize the city manager or his designee to amend an agreement with the unit first corporation for janitorial supplies. Um, we have a motion. Move to approve. Second. Okay. May we have a roll call vote? Council Member Perez? Yes. Council Member Hernandez? Yes. Council Member Gama? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez? Yes. Mayor Rollins? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, so now we're going to move, be moving on to the business items, the first of which is the City Port Community Benefit Fund update. And Mr. Peretz, you'll be giving that presentation. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, for the record, Deputy City Manager Charles Peretz. So uh, at the last City Council meeting on March 21st, the Council allocated the remaining balance of Community Benefit Fund dollars uh, to projects and during that same meeting at the end of the meeting there was a request for a future item to be agendized to discuss uh, FY 2223 uh, projects uh, potential projects uh, by way of quick review uh, the community benefit fund was created as part of a 2015 settlement agreement uh, between the city and the Oxnard Harbor district uh, per the terms of the agreement the district is to contribute hundred thousand dollars annually to the community benefit fund in years when their gross revenues uh, exceed $13 million. Uh, both of those amounts are subject to increases uh, via the CPI, which is why uh, during Kristen's presentation earlier tonight, we saw an approximated amount of $122,000 anticipated for next fiscal year. Uh, projects are to be discussed and determined within 180 days of the beginning of the fiscal year, uh, 180 days after July 1st. Uh, and as a quick reminder, uh, per the terms of the settlement agreement, there are four categories uh, that are eligible uh, for project categories. They are shoreline protection, community development, opportunistic endeavors, and other projects that are agreed to mutually by the parties. Uh, following up on one other comment that was made um, during the last discussion at the council, uh, starting tomorrow, uh, the city's website uh, as well as a link from our smartphone app, Go Wainimi, uh, residents or any interested parties uh, would have the opportunity to submit project, no project nominations uh, and for the city's uh, review and consideration. So with that, I revert to the council for the requested uh, discussion and consideration of potential projects for future community benefit funds. So tonight, would this be the in initial salvo where we would provide you with various different potential projects or how would that work, do you feel? It could be. Uh, this was a request of the council. If you have specific project considerations, we can discuss that. We can also uh, discuss the process by which council uh, could consider uh, either tonight or at future uh, meetings. Um, uh, or it could just set a plan uh, for the future consideration. Uh, again, we have 180 days after July 1st to consider and select uh, project ideas. Councilperson Hernandez. Thank you, Mayor Rollins. Uh, well, one of the things I think we should do is um, look at a, a policy, a, take a policy approach toward um, the community benefit fund um, that's coming up, and, and that is um, ask ourselves the questions, which ones do we want to retain? Because there's some in there that um, I think are worth um, repeating. For instance, the cat's cradle. Maybe we want to continue to support the robotics um, effort. Um, so maybe we should look at those and decide which ones we want to keep 
and then which new ones we want to um, introduce. I think that's worthy of a discussion. Um, but I also think that um, we have a little bit of housekeeping. Um, last meeting, we we're dealing with the funds that had yet been spent, and we came with the mural, right? That, those had to do with prior fiscal years. And then one of the things, and I submitted a uh, request, a nomination for a Chumash Heritage Walk, which would be in step with what has been approved or what I thought was approved, the uh, Bard Monument Fund that came as a result and the Muro that came as a result of um, ad hoc committee um, meeting with the port. So um, I guess what I'm saying is, is that um, we could do a number of things. We could um, decide on which ones we want to carry forward and then how much money is left over and then would we then say, okay, each council member would be able to make a nomination or would we as a council decide on one big project or three little ones or does each council member get to nominate one or, so those are the type of things I think that we have to um, consider, you know, coming up with a framework, if you will. Um, but I feel strongly about um, supporting youth through this community benefit fund and I think over the years, um, we've done that. Um, and um, so for me, I would like to see us continue to support um, Wainimi High School Athletics. I would like to see us um, maybe even step up the robotics to, to get more um, of Oxnard Union High School District schools participating in that um, Robotics First program. And um, I wrote it down, but I don't have it here. But it, I think um, focusing on, on our youth of our community, we heard tonight how um, the Little League is struggling to survive. And, um, you know, we know we have some ARPA money going that way, but then, you know, how much more is needed. So all those little discussions. So I would hope that we could come up with a framework that we could all agree on. Maybe that'd be the first step. I don't know. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. <clears throat> yes, I, I agree with Council Member Gama. Uh, I, I think we should have the the youth uh, focus. I was I had some ideas, you know, some some educational ideas that um, I don't know if you guys have seen those. Uh, I don't I don't even know what you would call them, but they have information on the birds. Um, they're all the way at the end of the beach. Uh, what what are they called? Plovers. Story storyboards. Yeah. Type. So I, I, I imagine like a bunch of these educational stations through, throughout the city or the beach, the parks, you know, that's just something that I was kind of thinking about. I think that's already included in the parks master plan, is it not? That, yeah, those educational stations. Uh, it, it's in one of the plans. I know one, one, the way I kind of look at it is we have kind of three sources of revenue. We have the community benefit fund, which is maybe 100,000, fairly small in the scope of things we have our cip project which is yet to be determined but it's quite a bit larger and then we have the leftover from the arpa and the, and the key is all our various different desires to better the community which pot they're going to fall into and which one uh, is going to you know is going to be able to handle the revenue to be able to do those things so i think uh, as i look at the community why, as I look at all of the f uh, community benefit fund in particular, I I have a personal thing that I would like to see it provide programs and things that directly benefit the residents, as opposed to tourism per se. I I would like to see that, but that's my particular opinion. Um, I um I along with the lines of the youth, I was put my thinking cap on the other day and like a lot of the um, families in this community don't have the um, resources to go out and uh, visit the environment, you know, perhaps go hiking, see our natural resources, have recreational opportunities. I know in other communities that I work, there were lots of different, there was money set aside for field trips to get the kids out into the 
the community and to see out of our community and see the other different resources and things that they could enjoy. And um, I would like to see that type of a thing. But I know we all have some really great ideas. So I think maybe can we make a commitment maybe within the next week or so that we provide like a laundry list of the different things that we would like to see and then work with our city management to figure out what pots they best fill into. Yes. yes, I would like to see also a breakdown. I know we have ARPA money going towards Bubbling Springs Park. I'd like to see exactly how that's going to break down, what that entails, and what is lacking and where we can fill in the gaps of that as well. So having a breakdown of actually where the money is going to go would be helpful. Mayor, um, I just wanted to add that I understand where you're having a presentation on the capital improvement plan coming up. And I think that might be the good, the best time to have that kind of discussion with regards to uh, requested projects or desired sure. projects, because then we can look to see where where the holes are, where the gaps are, and where what can be, how we're going to fill them, if whether it's through ARPA funding or the community benefit fund or, or CIP city funding. Project, yeah. um, but let's, I think, start there. The other thing I wanted to say was um, when I costed out the mural project, it was more that was allocated um, in this current year under the community benefit sure. fund. So we may be coming back um, this year for additional funds under the community benefit fund to actually fund yeah. that project in its completion. Yeah, I think once we, and I can see a, a laundry list developing, falling, in, and then we're going to have to prioritize where we you know, each one of those projects. Yeah, and I just wanted to add too, I, I, I agree that, you know, we want to make sure that our youth um, get the programs and the, the tools and the facilities that they need to run their programs here in this community. But I, rather than say, let's focus everything on youth, why don't we just um, agree that the projects will have a youth component to it? I think the mural, it's not directly, I mean, the purpose of it is not necessarily towards youth, it's toward the community, but it does have a youth yeah. element to it. No. And, then, and then I would suggest that using the artists from the Oxnard Union High School District student population would be a really great use of it. And I, uh, I was at the Maritime Museum the other day and they had a, an art exhibit from the Oxnard Union High School students and th the work there is amazing. So, you know, it could be very costly to hire a professional artist, but I think we could get the same quality by right. using. I mean, you still have to hire. You still have to have a professional artist do the design and supervise. But you can always bring the youth in but, uh, under instruction to to paint. It's not. But every art department at Oxford Union High School District has a very well okay. qualified art teacher. So, so. so anyway, those are kind of the details. Once we approve that, we're going to have an actual mural and how much it will be. Uh, how it's actually designed and who gets involved and I think we'll be involved in, uh, you know, once we approve that we want to in fact do something like that. And then one other point of clarification, um, I'm fuzzy on, we were successfully this past year got the um, uh, Learn to Swim program going with cooperation with Oxford Union High School District at Wyoming High School. That's funded from the general fund and not the community benefit fund, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So then that's good information because that was the third one on my list, Like, but I was unclear whether or not it was community benefit fund or coming out of our general fund. But w I think we all agree that's a really important program to continue, at least I hope so. It absolutely is, and, and it's been very well received by the community. Um, I just wanted to um, uh, follow up on uh, Councilmember uh, Hernandez's comment. It, it is the uh, city's intent, um, likely at the next meeting, and if not at the following meeting, uh, to bring an update. Uh, on the five-year CIP for Council's discussion. And, and the discussion and the agenda item will be intended to do exactly what was discussed by this Council, is um, to identify pots of money uh, to make decisions. Um, there are uh, certainly infrastructure and capital investments. Uh, there's also fiscal and debt management decisions that need to be made with any one-time monies that are available. And it's intended to have that global conversation about where uh, we should allocate uh, city funds. Great. Thank you. Hey, without any further discussion on this item. We will move on to number eight. Uh, we, I don't think we need a, 
a motion or a roll call for this, even though. Okay, so now we're going to move on to number eight. And that. Do we need to roll call vote on this? I don't think we. Not unless it actually takes. No, I don't think so. Okay. Except that the you'll be presenting it. The deferred until the next. Yeah. Yeah, we've, meeting we've provided you guidance for this next round, right? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay, so number eight is discussion of the requested <clears throat> ordinance prohibiting standing or panhandling on the center medians in the public right of ways. And that presentation will be given by our city attorney, Mr. Spaulding. Thank you, Mayor Rollins, and good evening, Honorable Council. Uh, on the February 22nd, 2022 regular city council meeting, at the end of the meeting, a request was made for staff to bring forth or develop an ordinance that addressed uh, public safety within city rights of way. Uh, specifically, it, it called out, um, you know, obviously it was at the end of a meeting, so there wasn't much discussion on it, but it, it called out people standing on center medians and things of that nature as, as a public safety issue. Um, the purpose of this discussion is once any government starts regulating in the public right of way, even if it's conduct, we're all familiar with the with the uh, Martin versus Boise case, and that's just merely being present, and it implicates the Eighth Amendment. Um, it, it, lots of things can constitute speech, such as such as uh, soliciting or or begging or anything like that, has been found by the Ninth Circuit and the United States Supreme Court to constitute protected speech. Um, so the purpose of this is really to allow the council to engage in a discussion to more narrowly focus, or at least my impression was, and you've probably heard me say this before in other, in other areas, is that we need to identify the specific problem to be addressed and uh, the specific locations at which the conduct would be prohibited or, or what it is. And I, I'm really emphasizing conduct here because if we start getting into non-content neutral type restrictions like solicitation for X is prohibited, but other types of solicitation, like for example, Girl Scouts selling cookies door to door wouldn't be prohibited. That's facially contract, uh, content discriminatory and whatnot. And that gets into serious First Amendment implications and things of that nature. Um, and it, it, it's simply to kind of foreclose some of those challenges that we can do so that we can already craft an ordinance that will actually attack the harm sought to be prevented by the council in an, in an not an over-inclusive or under-inclusive or over-broad sort of way in an effort to avoid any constitutional challenge to it. Um, in addition, <coughs> I would be remiss if I didn't inform the council of Fort Winnie Municipal Code Section 3238, which pertains to uh, pedestrian regulations, and it essentially says that no person shall stand in any roadway other than in a safety zone or in a crosswalk if such action interferes with the lawful movement of traffic. Uh, this section obviously doesn't apply to public safety personnel and, and people acting in the course of their own duties. In addition, it talks about uh, no pedestrian shall cross a roadway at any other place other than by a route at right angles to the curb or by the shortest route to the opposite curb except at a marked crosswalk. We also have California State jaywalking ordinances, no stopping of vehicles at red cur curbs. The reason, the reason I identify all of these is because courts routinely including the Ninth Circuit, will go to what is the least restrictive available means to accomplish the stated goals. And the Ninth Circuit routinely points to things like, jaywalking is illegal. You have this ordinance. And in one of the cases, the uh, city of Redondo Beach, where their ordinance on aggressive solicitation and people actually jumping into the right-of-way to jump into cars and go work, which was overthrown by the Ninth Circuit, um, they had 3238 our own ordinance word for word verbatim and the court took issue with the fact that there was not enough evidence showing that this did not work and so mm. if our issue is medians we could probably modify 3238 and try to add language to make it a little bit more expansive we also have the issue of over breadth and in that same city of redondo beach case the ninth circuit took issue with the fact that the city was really only complaining about two or three locations within the city there was no need for it to encompass all public rights of way in the city, including residential and non-commercial and things like that. So that's the real purpose of this discussion is to really identify what's the harm and what's the narrowest way we can go about crafting something. So, oh, no, you go ahead, you first. So the initial issue was brought up was twofold. The, the main one was the main issue was um, 
having individuals standing in certain busy intersections, um, distracting drivers and potentially causing accidents and whether there could be something done. It was brought by law enforcement, whether there was something that could be done to keep people from standing in those specifically Channel Islands and Ventura Road uh, mediums because they're very distractive and, and disruptive and distracting drivers and people were jumping from that area industry it was it was that was the initial context of the conversation okay and so it, it sounds like the the conduct to be prevented is specifically busy intersections in like let's say business corridors and just simply being present outside of a crosswalk or other safety zone as defined by our ordinances correct okay uh were there any other concerns or there any other localities within the city that we would want to stop something like that happening no it was primary the um, center medians associated with channel islands boulevard and ventura road areas okay so what my next uh, what my next objective would be uh, is i would follow up with law enforcement the port winnie police department uh, probably commander albertson and talk to whoever i need to talk to in order to find out where they're seeing this type of behavior what the behavior is, uh, what methods they have taken to enforce it, and if there is a potential for modifying 3238 or bringing forth another ordinance, I would bring that forth uh, in, in the next couple of meetings um, for a forced, uh, first reading, depending on how labor intensive it is to write it. Um, and, and then again, just as a, as a quick uh, aside, we're a little bit off topic, but we're within the Brown Act agenda item. Uh, if the council doesn't like something that's in a first reading, that would definitely be the time to amend it because we can amend it right then and there and read it into the record. And then when we go to second reading, we can just add that language. But after first reading is closed and adopted, there can be no substantive changes or we have to start all over. Got it. Council person here. Knows. I think uh, okay. council member Perez answered my question because I was concerned about how this originated, where it came from. And I think I know it, it was a- I will add another caveat to that is it was brought up from an officer an issue was happening they brought it up to commander to be able to enforce it the commander had indicated there's nothing on our books that can be enforced so there was nothing that could be done okay i'll follow up with commander albertson on that uh, if that's yeah. if that's uh, council's direction uh council person gala i was not oh no i'm sorry i, I oh, thought you she didn't no no, no i was still i had my mouth open <laughs> Um, I still wanted to um, ask if there was any connection between this request and this man who was jumping on somebody's car um, way back when. It's related to that because some, one of the individuals was pretty violent and I guess they were able to get multiple straining orders or something, but it's, it's related to that issue okay. to keep that issue from repeating itself and to keep people okay because it seems to me that that there's definitely some law against yeah. that okay thank you <laughs> thank you um council person go so channel islands and uh ventura road is in oxnard fyi one side is but the side that we're talking about is in oxnard no we're talking about the wainimi side that's enforceable our officers wouldn't care about the, they, they wouldn't bring up the Oxnard side. The border ends at uh, the Wiener Snipsel, I believe. No, the Channel Islands, it goes this, that's Wainimi. If it goes this way, it's Oxnard. If it passes, there's a corner there that is Wainimi only. So, but I think the problem that I'm hearing is, is, because I've seen it, I've seen guys fighting, but the, the person standing, if you're traveling north on Ventura Road and you hit Channel Islands, the, per the person on that medium? Is that what we're there talking about? There are two corners of Wainimi. There's the one directionally. There are two corners of Wainimi. And this was specifically one of our city limit corners. It has but, nothing to do with the Oxnard side. But, there's but, but ultimately, we can enforce anything in, right. if it's in Oxnard. Well, that's what yeah. I'm yeah. trying yeah. to clarify because the only Channel Islands and Ventura Road would be straight out from KFC. Right? Yeah. We all agree on that? I'd have to see a map. Okay. Well, it's all but, corners. But, but, I mean, the ultimate thing is that we can only enforce what's within our city, whatever ordinances we come up with. Am I correct? Yes, you're correct. And Oxnard has various ordinances that they would be enforcing as well, okay. uh, some of which are, are 
more sure. robust than what's been suggested sure. here. I mean, I've also seen issues on the corner of uh, Channel Islands and Victoria. You know, Correct. That's yeah. Clearly yeah. within our. That's clearly one. Yes. Yeah. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I maybe just we we should probably also find a way to get a hold of Oxnard and just let them know like if uh, they can jump on board. Yeah. yeah. What they're doing. Yeah, if they're doing what anything. They're doing. Yeah. Maybe we could all do the same thing because we do have a little intersection of cities there. At I think we all agree that one side is Oxnard, the other side is Wainimi, and then the middle is yeah. Oxnard. And no, yeah, it's a weird. My, my, oh, I'm sorry. The, the best way would have been if that whole corner was Wainimi, but it's not. And it's just weird how it's like a little zigzag in this, yeah, yeah. this crosstalk. But yeah. My, my question has always been like, um, people standing in those dividers as it is because they're really meant to be a landscape function they're not necessarily meant for people to stay there and my main concern has been the safety of people who hang out in a very small cylindrical area and sometimes they may or may not be in the best physical shape um, maybe because of what they ate or drank and they could fall into the roads and it's more of a safety issue more than preventing free speech. Yeah, I, yeah. Right. And, and what the Ninth Circuit says to that is you already have this ordinance. So there's no need to do something that's more advanced unless you can prove this ordinance has no effect. And that's where the Ninth Circuit, that's why I specifically called out this as well as jaywalking, which is a California vehicle code violation, as well as any number of things like when people would start going into like panhandling and aggressive panhandling, intimidation is already illegal, assault is already illegal, these things are already adding more things, it tends to arouse the ire of the court. The other question is, is, is like you said, these people are not in the might not be in the right frame of mind, they might be standing on the median. Are they any more or less of a public safety danger standing on the sidewalk? I think so, because it's, the sidewalk is meant to be stood on right but while a divider is not necessarily meant to be stood on but theoretically a car can jump a sidewalk just as easy as it can a divider a person can jump from a sidewalk into traffic just as easily from a divider car, and a car can do many things that right but these doing but the reason i'm bringing this up is because these are the things that if you're challenged these are the questions the ninth circuit or some other court will have and where they will look for those answers is this discussion yeah so i, I you know if the intent is to prevent that I think then part of it is also going to be that, you know, the the police are, the imp impression I get is the police feel restricted that they cannot get involved in that whatsoever. And, in fact, what you're saying is perhaps depending on the crafting of the ordinance or the uh, adjusting of it, they would be able to act in some manner that would help deal with the situation right in my legal opinion there are numerous there are numerous avenues law enforcement could take as as the laws currently exist if we need to amend some language and change some words so that we fit better definitions because a lot of these things let me see this was written in of course it's not going to tell me my bet is is that th this is a pretty boilerplate ordinance that you see across california and probably came from some model model code that was published in 1964 when words all were given the same meaning and everybody kind of knew what roadway meant. Does roadway encompass median? Terms not defined here. What we can do is we can start going through some of this, adding words, adding definitions, updating it and modernizing it so that this is clearly applicable to medians. Yeah. This is clearly applicable to different, in essence, we can, we can update it to give the police the tools. If there's ambiguity okay. that the police don't feel gives them enforcement authority, mm -hmm. I will follow up with Commander Albertson if it's if it's council's direction, and and we can start going through this and finding out why is it law enforcement can't do the law, uh, can't enforce these things as they currently exist. Yeah, because I've sensed some frustration when I've talked to people, the police that you know they they feel that their hands are tied and maybe they're not. They they just need to be educated, or maybe we can do something to make their hands less tied to deal with the problem. Yeah, absolutely. So, do we need to vote? And so. What would we need to vote on? I, I have a question. Um, oh, so sorry. are you recommending not doing an ordinance? I was simply trying to get council's direction as to whether or not they want me to proceed with an ordinance or whether or not council wants to. Uh, in essence, I was, I was seeking clarification 
on what is the scope of what council's request is. Because if this is an aggressive panhandling ordinance, my recommendation would be don't touch it. Right. It's too legally, you'll find yourself in the Ninth Circuit real quick. Right. But if this is regulating conduct and doesn't in any way implicate speech and has nothing to do with preventing, I don't know, homeless encampments on medians and runs afoul of Martin B. Boise, these are all different stories, but we need to have that conversation so that I don't bring forth an ordinance that doesn't come anywhere close to it. it you know, this neutral ordinance that is the safest possible thing we could bring forward that once again, law enforcement looks at and goes, why'd you bother? I think it might be better to do that evaluation like you're suggesting and, and see where, if any, we could strengthen some of the laws that are needing updated on the books because I, I know we're all frustrated, society's frustrated with the fact that we can't help people that need mental help. You know, we literally have nowhere to service them. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I would hope that um, we could do the, so, create so the least amount of risk legally, but at the same time trying to keep in mind safety of our community. Absolutely. So, so could we have a motion by somebody? A motion to further investigate for discovery I would I would say a uh, um, motion to uh, have the city attorney co cooperate with the police department uh, to bring forth an ordinance addressing council's concerns as they've been made here tonight. Okay. I like that. Do we have a second? I'll have a second. Okay. Can we list council concerns? I, I'm, what are the concerns? Uh, public safety issues surrounding uh, busy intersections. I have on record, because this is all being recorded for posterity's sake, the specific intersection that's in mind, at least on the Port Winnemi side. Uh, what I took the council direction to be was not just that specific intersection, but similar, similarly situated intersections where you have busy business traffic. We're not really talking about residential neighborhoods. We're talking about areas where there's significant traffic and being present on the median represents a very clear danger to both the traffic as well as the person. Yeah, I know I had a concern r regarding the, the Ralph Shopping Parking District. You have very thin medians and I see people there and I, and I was really concerned that someone's going to get hurt one day because of the volatility of their movement. So one of the things that I can look at and I can follow up with with Chief and Commander and, and Mr. Stewart, who all have abandoned me, um, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> is, is I, can, I can look at the zoning and whatnot and see how we've designated certain corridors and certain districts uh, throughout the city. And it might make sense just to look at a specific zone or a, or a designation of streets and say, in this area, this is prohibited, uh, but I don't know offhand how it's all designed or laid out. That sounds like a, a Tony Stewart question. Okay. Because medians are not just, they're not landscape. They don't have a landscape purpose as much as they do a traffic control, a pedestrian safety purpose. You know, and you'll find them a, a lot in large intersections where you might not make it across the street by the time the clock stops ticking. And so you've got to seek refuge at that middle yeah, but uh, interesting, like they're median before, before you can make the rest and wait for the next green light yeah. before you can complete your cross. So, so a simple a simple question has all sorts of not so yeah. simple thoughts. And interesting, some of them are actually before the actual sidewalk. I mean, before the there the you have the walkways and there the medians are actually before then, so you'd have to hop into them to get out. Which I'm, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we, we, you know, there's another risk, uh, a coral tree or a eucalyptus tree falling down and striking you. <laughs> Maybe we should have a warning sign. I don't sign. think we have any coral trees on no, no. Yeah, we do. <laughs> yes, we do. Well played. Okay, so we have a motion. Right. We digress. Mo we, we have the motion that uh, our city attorney has developed that we have a motion on it. Do we have a second? Yeah, we just seconded. I believe Charles has a point of order. Pardon me? Uh, Kevin was very articulate in offering a potential motion. Um, we had a second, but none of the council members yeah. actually made the motion. So if we could just have someone. Oh, no, I thought, no, she made the motion. I think, I think, no, she seconded I think it. Council member Perez seconded the motion. Oh, she, so she didn't make the main motion? Somebody needs to make I'll, the motion. I'll make the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Ms. <laughs> Mayor Pro Tem will make the motion. I'm second. Rich. And <laughs> council. So let's have a roll call vote. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. 
Councilmember Gama? Yes. Mayor Rollins? Yes. Motion pass passes unanimously. Okay, we are now moving on to city manager's comments and reports. Uh, Mr. Peretz. Okay, a couple of uh, quick updates as <clears throat> was mentioned briefly before, and I know the council is aware, but wanted to share with the public. Um, Port Wanimi, uh, Port Wanimi's recently adopted general plan was the recipient of two uh, awards. The first was uh, the Document Merit Award from the Association of Environmental Professionals, and the second uh, was the Award of Excellence from the American Planning Association. So I just wanted to remind the council um, and let the public know uh, that kudos is, is due to our community development staff uh, for winning those uh, awards. Uh, the next thing I wanted to bring to everybody's attention is that the week of April 10th through 16th is Police Dispatcher Week, also officially known as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week. Uh, so this is an opportunity to um, honor and appreciate uh, all of the good work that the dispatchers do to help keep our, our community safe. Um, we will be uh, putting some information together on uh, social media to let the community know about that and once again honor and appreciate uh, those that are in the ditch dispatch uh, function for our city. Um, we have an extravaganza event coming up at the uh, Orvine S. Carpenter Community Center uh, that will occur on April 16th. The event is designed for children 10 years of age and under. It'll feature a petting zoo, face painting, uh, crack craft activity with our youth librarian, uh, and there'll also be a book sale uh, hosted by the Friends of the Library. The event's scheduled for 9 to 11 that day, and the actual egg hunt is scheduled to begin at 9.30, so. So the event is an egg hunt? It, yes, okay. yeah. there's other, as I say, other activities going on with Facebook. So what's the name of the egg event? Egg Extravaganza. Oh, I thought you said A and A Extravaganza, I not said egg. it too quickly, or perhaps it was my <laughs> East Coast accent. No, it's the Egg Extravaganza on April okay. 16th, uh, 9 to 11, and again, for all those families that are gonna participate, uh, be there prior to 9.30 to participate in the actual egg hunt. Um, and then I did also want to just make some brief comments uh, about the city's efforts out at Bubbling Springs uh, with regard to the Little League. Um, uh, staff did meet with an architect at the end of last week. Um, the president of the, the Little League was there, so I believe she is aware, but that was done in an effort to develop uh, building plans and also expedite um, any uh, actions that are necessary to acquire the necessary permits to get the snack bar back in operation. Um, as well, um, I just wanted to remind the council that the action uh, last December in approval of the ARPA funds included $25,000 to the Little League to try to account for revenues lost during COVID due to uh, the shutdown and, and inability for them to uh, participate uh, during COVID, um, as well as the $1.4 million uh, for rehabbing and development of athletic fields. And I, and I did hear a request earlier for some additional detail uh, and information about what that includes, but just wanted to remind the council that those allocations were made from, uh, from ARPA dollars. Um, we've also received a request and staff has responded uh, that there is a, a willingness to sit down with uh, the league president uh, and discuss uh, their requests for amended terms of the existing lease that we have. It is um, uh, in a lease that was mentioned earlier during public comment and does place uh, responsibilities on the league and we are uh, happy to sit down and, and consider uh, amendments to the lease so I anticipate that those meetings <clears throat> will occur in the near term and just wanted to let the yeah. council know about that. Mr. Peretz I understand there's twenty thousand dollars also in the capital improvement plan for the snack bar the snack house itself is that um, still we, we have there? allocated dollars that are uh, that uh, if necessary would be used uh, for the architect to help uh, devise uh, building plans um, and any other associated documents to help bring it up to code and get the permits through the health department. Okay. So, so ult ultimately, the money that we have set aside, there seem to be a lot of needs tonight, lighting needs, snack bar needs, field maintenance needs. Um, so it's going to be, I guess, up to us to prioritize because I have a feeling that's more funds than the ARPA funds will provide. Yeah, without any specific cost estimates, I'd agree generally with that comment. Um, the needs uh, will probably exceed any funds that are currently allocated for that area. Uh, but as we referenced before, uh, future discussions about the, the five-year CIP uh, will allow the council to make decisions about the allocation of dollars um, at that park, other parks. And, and staff will be getting together with the Little League as to developing what their priorities might be. 
yeah, staff has uh, definitely offered and expressed an interest in uh, meeting with the league president to talk about uh, about the lease and any other specific uh, okay. requests that they have. And then lastly, um, in continuation of something that began in February, I wanted to read the names of employees that are um, experiencing work anniversaries in the month of March and April. Um, and then before I do that, just a brief teaser, we have a talent committee that is working on a little bit more of a formalized uh, employee recognition program. We hope to be rolling that out in the near term. Uh, but for now, I'll go through and just read the names of employees that uh, celebrated their work anniversaries in, in March and April of this year. Uh, starting with Antonio Almanza, who celebrated 33 years with the city. Wow. Uh, Juan Diaz uh, reached his 24 year mark. Uh, Aaron Wiedemeyer, uh, who is in this very room. Aaron. How long is Aaron? <laughs> uh, Aaron has been with the city for 18 years. Wow. Uh, Jesus Chavez, uh, 17 years. Eric Starna, 14 years. Uh, Andrew Salinas, Don Villafana, and Tony Stewart all celebrated their fifth year with the city. Wow. Uh, Kimberly Mora, Charles Cable, Albert Pachenko all celebrated four years with the city. Curtis Fitchner uh, completed three years with the city. Lupe Acero, Alexis Pacheco uh, completed two years. And Ernesto Gonzalez, Anthony Martinez, and Gabby Aragin practiced that earlier, so I'm pretty sure that's right. Uh, Gabby Aragin uh, all completed their first year uh, with the city either this month or the month of March. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that says. Congratulations to everybody. Congratulations. Thank you for sticking, and in sticking with the city for so long, <laughs> making it a good city. I yes. like that. Okay. Uh, at this point in time, we will go to council member reports and comments, starting with Mr. Gama. All right. So earlier this week, we all received an email from a gentleman named Geoff Gase. And I wanted to bring it up um, because um, one of the things that I find problematic is um, when there's a problem that may be in our city that sometimes all of us have a different interpretation of the facts. And in this particular case, this reminds me of um, the Halico beach vagrant issue three years ago that you know when when i first brought it up it was like hey that's in the city of oxnard stay in your lane but it was affecting the city of port Wyneme, and then uh, you know we brought it up and then eventually cooperated with the city of oxnard to eradicate that debris and all that stuff but in this particular case this person sent us all an email about the Halico site and in his email he said things like it's cancer causing and deadly waste materials we really have you know I don't know that that is the case and then when spe in speaking with several people in our community everybody has a different understanding of Halico one very well respected community member told me it would cost a billion dollars to clean it up and they're not going to clean it up and that's why they capped it and it's like well th i know that not to be true and then i'm told by another person it's radioactive waste and of course this person um says it's radioactive waste and i know that not to be true as well and so i took it upon myself to forward this email to to um the city of oxnard um their manager um their city council and while this is not in our jurisdiction, I think it affects us because when people are out there saying things that may not be true, and, and you can stand on the pier and look and see the Halico site, you know, I think it's something that we should be concerned about. So what I suggested that perhaps we could do is have a slag summit so that all of us could be armed with facts, with the known facts, so that we all could participate in keeping factual information out there regarding Halico. Because when somebody in the email says, and I have his email right here, he says, uh, currents are taking this and distributing it throughout California. I don't think that's true. And, um, and so anyways, I spoke with Brian McDonald. He's a PMK, the person most knowledgeable over at Oxnard. And he, uh, he um, communicated to me that, 90% of the material out there has an industrial purpose and is useful, and there's 
companies lined up ready to take use of that material. So anyways, I just think maybe we could look to work with the city of Oxnard to, to come up with a white paper that lets us all know what the facts are so that we could be armed, just like we said earlier with the port, you know, we have this wonderful presentation. We need to arm ourselves with factual data so that we can, when someone comes and makes, hey, aren't the trucks supposed to go only down Rice Road? Well, no, that's not actually true. You know, here's the facts. And so I just wanted to bring that up because I think it is, um, the environment is for everybody. And yes, we have a border. However, it, I think it does affect us. And uh, we cooperated with the city of Oxford before in regards to that. Um, in hearing about these fields, and I, you know, we've, We've since becoming on the council, we've made it a priority to address the ailing state of our parks, all our parks. Um, and uh, I know at first it was gophers and we seem to have got that eradicated, but I was coming over the bridge today and I looked over at College Park and that park's been there for quite some time and their fields are amazing. And, and there's not one flower in the field. And you know what that means? There's no weeds. And when you look across certain parts in our community, you see flowers across the playing field, and that means it's weeds. And so one of the things I noticed with eradicating the gophers, the weeds are back. Apparently, the gophers really like to eat marigolds. So what I would suggest to staff is um, get in touch with Oxnard and see what they're doing over there at, at College Park, because they're doing a wonderful job. And, and if we can learn from them, that, that's a great, great thing. Um, also, Sometimes some people say that we're asking too much of staff, and I was told that, and I kind of took it personally because I pride myself in when I see graffiti, I'm going to do a go-gov, and <laughs> I've done a lot of them. And when this person approached me and said, hey, you know, you're taking up too much staff time, and why is graffiti such a priority? And, and I'm thinking, well, wait, am I really off base here? But then I got a copy of our strategic plan. And our strategic plan speaks about us getting our city to be excellent. And so relying on our, our city, our strategic plan, I believe it is in our best interest to demand the best. And um, when it comes to our fields, same thing. It's like our fields should be number one and we should compete and we should look to our neighbors who are doing a good job with their fields and figure out how we could have the same quality of fields. And again, I just think it's super important, and um, hopefully we could um, phone a friend and learn from our neighbors what they're doing, because it seems to be working over there. Also, with the, we started the process to begin to organize our SAN Summit for this year. As you know, we've had a massive increase in the funding available for the biannual bypassing, and so we're really thankful for that. So we're beginning we're looking probably near the end of May to have our, our sand summit. So, um, and uh, we also have the egg extravaganza coming up on April 16th. Thank you, Charles, and that's it. Council person. Thank you, Mayor Rollins. I just have a, three events I wanted to bring to the council and the public's attention. Um, April is uh, also month for National Library Week. Um, Library, National Library Week is April 3rd through the 9th, and the theme this year is Connect With Your Library. And um, as a member of the Ventura County Library Foundation, you know, I've learned a lot about what libraries are today, and, and they're not the libraries we all grew up with, maybe. They're not just about books. They include technology and computers and a lot of different resources. Um, for our young and our elderly. So um, I encourage everybody to connect with our local library, um, maybe even join Friends of the Library if you can, because they, they need all the volunteers that uh, they can use. And um, we're also hosting, the Ventura County Library Foundation is hosting a home tour of the homes that were, some of the homes that were lost during the Thomas Fire um, in 2017. Six homes will be on display on April 30th. And you can um, buy a ticket, I believe, for $30 on, uh, to come on April 30th and tour the homes and see the lovely homes and, and hear the stories of how these families rebuilt their lives and rebuilt their, their homes uh, following uh, the destruction of the fire. Uh, there's also Earth Day coming up on April 22nd. And uh, last year, we did the cleanup of Boker Park. And I 
we thought Boker Park was pretty clean when we got there. You know, we, we did manage to pick up some trash, but what I'm gonna do this year, and I'm gonna kind of put a challenge out to the rest of the council members and, and those um, out there listening who represent HOAs, is I'm gonna work with my HOA and um, develop a flyer and get our um, residents out to clean the surrounding areas of our complex at Las Palomas. And so I wanna challenge all our, um, the people listening and fellow Alone council members to, we don't need buckets, we'll, we'll use something more uh, recyclable, but thank you for that, okay. yeah. I'm sure you'll be using them on Saturday because we're gonna do this on Saturday the 23rd anyway. Okay. But, no, we have plenty, we have extra Oh, okay, thank you, thank you. So, um, so what is the day that the bulk are is again? I remember it was what there last the year. Day? The challenge day is April 23rd, Saturday. So I'll be putting together a flyer, I'll share it with you. So if you're interested in getting your um, HOAs and uh, your res lo local residents interested in uh, cleaning up around their na own neighborhoods, um, you're welcome to use it. You know, I just, I feel there's, you, um, Councilman Gama's done such a great job down at the beach. The beach is so clean. I think we need to focus a little inland now. So uh, this is just an effort to, to focus inland. Um, the and entire recognize city nice. Yes, absolutely, and beautify our city in, in other ways. Um, so that's Earth Day is April 22nd, but the challenge day is April 23rd. Do we have a contest? Well, I didn't want to, I don't have time to really organize a contest or to, or to get to issue a prize or anything. Maybe just a recognition before, and I don't know how you would judge it. How there's would you like, judge? Like 38 HOAs in the city. Yeah. I, I'm not going to do my own HOA because it's really clean. <laughs> they do a great job of, yeah. of our neighborhood, so yeah. I think I'll pick another neighborhood that might need some help. Yeah. In, in our effort to recognize volunteerism, if we do uh, can know people that didn't <coughs> get involved, that I think that would be a nice yeah, thing. Yeah, if you choose to do that, that would be fine sure. too. Get you off the pickleball court. Huh? Pickle court. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is on April 19th, we are on schedule to uh, do the dedication for Pedro Valdez, who was killed a year ago, April 19th. And uh, Mayor Pro Tem Martinez and I are working on that together. Um, there will be a program. You'll be our official speaker, Mayor Pro Tem uh, Martinez. You'll be our official speaker. I'll, I'll help uh, introduce you. And we'll have some members of the family also speak. We'll have uh, some music. And we'll do a formal dedication of the bike repair station, which will be located at the bicycle stands right outside Surfside Restaurant. So that's 4 p.m. April 19th. Okay, yeah. and I just wanted to thank staff and the city manager for getting this through the Citizens Advisory Board, because I know you guys were struggling to get the, um, you know, the Heroes Heritage application through. Uh, for that, so I appreciate. And the I'll just add for for public consumption, we have just identified a, a date and a time for the Citizen Advisory Commission meeting. That'll be next Monday, April 11th, uh, at 4 p.m. It'll be an in-person meeting at the Cor uh, Orvine S. Carpenter Community Center. So hopefully, the application will be approved, and then it'll come to us on uh, our meeting of the, the 18th. 18th, and we can follow through with a presentation on the 19th. So we're cutting it close. So, but uh, I think it'll be a a, a very heartfelt and important um, presentation for the family and for the bicycle riders who were also impacted. I'm sorry. Cool. 4 p.m. Okay, that's all I have, thank you. Okay, to follow up on the um, Pedro, I'm gonna be creating, I'm working with a number of people and it's in the works, it's still in the early stages, um, but a mental health summit, which encompasses everybody involved in mental health from uh, behavioral health to uh, DA Nasarinko and everybody who wants to be participating in that and different organizations, including NAMI and the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And hopefully that will be in June uh, it's to create pretty much a round table to discuss the issues that are happening in Ventura County, uh, specifically the lack of resources, the need for funding, and how to go about fixing, um, coming up with ways that will actually benefit and fix the issues that are happening in Ventura County. So, I don't have a date set, but I am. it'll be in the works and I'll be obviously 
bring it to the council. Can we talk about the NAMI walk too? Remind us about that. Oh, the NAMI walk. If anyone is not aware, the NAMI walk is May 21st. If you have not created a team, you can go to NAMI Ventura County, create a team, and raise funds for NAMI. In May, we'll have several um, events happening around the community. Every city pretty much is participating, and we'll have shirts. I'll be posting that on social media, but we'll have shirts um, that people can buy, and all proceeds will be going to support NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness, and they offer great um, free training for from children to law enforcement to every uh, peer support groups, anyone who's struggling with mental illness. It's all free. Um, I'll be teaching a class coming up at the end of May for Family to Family, which is to teach family members who have someone struggling with mental illness and help teach you how to deal, live with them, get them to resources or, or whatever other issues that you're dealing with. So NAMI is a great uh, resource if anyone has any struggles or knows somebody that's struggling. I would just like to let everybody know that there will be a basketball tournament, a three-point contest, both for adults and youth on Easter Sunday, April 17th. Uh, we'll be out there from 9 a.m. to around noon, and the actual three-point contest will be at 10 a.m. Thank you. I'm just going to piggyback on all the different things that people have said. Um, um, first of all, the memorial, one of the things that I think is really good about the memorial is it's going to be a usable, ongoing thing for bike riders, and that's what Pedro and his friends really relished the ability to um, ride and visit, be a part of the community and visit the community. And the fact that there's something that will be an ongoing thing that will benefit the entire community, I think will be a, a very good use of those funds. Um, mentioning what uh, Councilman Gama said, uh, I truly do want to know what the true, uh, 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 what is underneath um, that ground? Because I think uh, for many, many years, the Ormond Beach vision has been to be able to make that usable for the community. And, it's a super fun site. And it's a super fun <laughs> yes. site. And you can um, read about it under the EPA. Yeah. Website. And in my conversations with uh, uh, some of the people from the city of council is that, in fact, that we're going to need to get the EPA involved to give us an up to date idea of what's there so that we can move forward but i mean it's always been a, a wonder to me like a natural resource like that that you know that the community could benefit how we can all put our heads and funds together to do it hopefully someday um let's see um yeah on another comment regarding the uh the field maintenance um and i probably have brought it up before is like, you know, I think we need, I guess it'll be on my request, but I'd like to see some kind of an update because I know we approved a number of positions for landscape maintenance and uh, uh, perhaps as a future, you can give an update as to what, what ones have been hired, what ones still need to be hired and if there's any kind of problems with hiring them. Um, and then finally, um, for residents of Port Wyneme in this area, they have a new program um, through the Ventura County Transportation Commission. For if you for ten dollars, you can go on weekends to downtown Los Angeles. Uh, you can go to Orange County, and it's a ten dollar one fee. And you can come back on Sunday, and you can enjoy Los Angeles or Orange County, or visit your family and friends. And the ten dollar will also uh, allow you to use the local buses, you know, as an attachment to that. And LA and Kind is hoping to do the similar type of a thing where they can come to Ventura County and utilize all our, of our resources and benefit from our community. And so that's something that's coming by. I'm going to provide some information on our city website so the community can be aware of that. That's all that I have to say. Um, so, Request for future agenda items. Um, I have nothing. I'd um, like. Okay. I'd like an update on what we're going to be doing to help out the 
Wanimi Little League. You know, just like an update on the next city council meeting, at least, or as soon as possible. Second that. There's a motion on an update on the Wainimi Little League uh, needs for improvement of the snack bar and other things. And we have a second. Um, can we have a vote? Mayor Pro Tem Martinez? Yes. Councilmember Gama? Yes. Councilmember Hernandez? Yes. Councilmember Perez? Yes. Mayor Rollins? Yes, with the caveat that we have all of these other different improvements that we're going to be including with the ARPA and where we're going to spend that money and how we're going to spend it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> you can't change the motion. No, it was a comment. Okay. I didn't make a change. <laughs> I, would, I would like to follow up on Mayor Rollins, the uh, classic comp study to find out um, where we are with that, and, and I know we're having some issues hiring, so what we can do to better facilitate some employment. Um, that was brought up, I think, at the last meeting. We have it on our action tracker, um, so there's no need for a council vote tonight. It'll either be at the meeting on the 18th or the subsequent meeting. We will bring a presentation uh, with the consultant uh, that has been working on the project. Well, then I would like to suggest that uh, we have an agenda item in the very near future that's going to tell us how we're going to overcome our hiring problems. And I think the class of comp is clearly, if we don't pay enough, that we need to pay more. Um, we have a budget coming up. So so my motion for an agenda item is is to be updated on what we're going to do to resolve this problem in hiring competitive employees. I'll second. I'm sorry, who was the second? Council Member Perez. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you seconded it. <laughs> no, yeah. yeah. Council Member Gama. Yes. Council Member Perez. Yes. Council Member Hernandez. OK. <laughs> Well, he just said we we're going to be talking about it, so we'll be have an opportunity to ask those questions during the during that time when he they present the study. So, no, I don't think so. Was that a yes? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Martinez. Yes. Mayor Rollins. Yes, and my comment, even though I'm not changing the motion, <laughs> uh, is that you know in that report that you are going to provide that you've gotten our intentions that it will be comprehensive enough to cover those areas. Okay. <laughs> so with that in mind, uh, can we close tonight's meeting in honor of Autis Autism Month? Sure. I'm wearing my tie. Certainly. Do we need a vote? I don't think so. No, I think I think that's just it. understood. In honor of Autism Awareness Month. I like that. Right. Okay. Very good. So I am now going to adjourn this meeting at 8.51 in honor of, of um, Autism Awareness Month. All right. Thank you. I haven't done that.